I see a lot of posts about configuring VLANs, how and why do we use VLANs and what's needed to do a VLAN. VLANs can be a bit alien to some people. I remember when I first started doing VLANs, the countless amount of times that I lost access to the network switch because of misconfiguration and questioning whether I need to tag or untag a port, set a port to a trunk or an access port. But in the grand scheme of things, VLANs are pretty straightforward. VLANs or virtual local area networks are logically partitioned networks separating the LANs into segmented broadcast domains on a physical managed network switch. VLANs operate at layer two of the OSI model, the data link layer. VLANs can use membership tags which are inserted into the ethernet frame which a layer two switch would understand and use the information to send the relative information to a specific port. VLANs are a great way to separate physical networking hosts into logical broadcast domains without the need to purchase additional equipment such as hubs or switches. Broadcasts are a way for hosts and devices to find each other on a network using an all-to-all -all communication method. This can flood the network and use up the switch resources leading to a degradation in network performance. Devices that are on a VLAN will only send up broadcasts to the switch ports that are part of that broadcast domain. As well as adding a layer of security and a system of performance on the network, VLANs are also used, for instance, in an office environment to separate departments or businesses. Placing departments into VLANs will help with identifying network resources. For instance, if HR had a printer on their office floor and accounts had a printer on their office floor, without a VLAN, HR could accidentally print to accounts and accounts could accidentally print to HR. Then printers could be set over different floors of a building or be on completely different buildings and it could just be a big confusion for everybody. It's also good practice to implement VLANs to keep any management devices away from end users such as network switches, routers and wireless access points. Just in case some tech savvy employee thinks he can fix the problem with the Wi-Fi so tries logging into the access point but could just cause more damage than good. I'll demonstrate the VLAN configuration from a central switch out to secondary switches and then I'll demonstrate VLAN configuration from one switch, daisy chain to others. I'll show this from the web user interface and I'll also do it from the command line. Let's go ahead and configure a few VLANs for accounts, management, human resources, and a server. Then I'll go ahead and show into VLAN routing. But for this setup, I have an Arachnus AN310 router, an Arachnus AN21024 port switch, and two Arachnus AN210 8 port switches, as well as an Arachnus AN510 wireless access point. In the past video, I configured VLANs within SSID, so I won't go into too much detail on that type of setup on this video. Configuring VLANs just at a switching layer will keep hosts in their respective broadcast domains, allowing communication between them hosts. If you were to connect your laptop to a switch port, you would get a self-assigned APIPA address such as 169.254.x.x. You could then move on to a layer 3 switch to provide some routing protocols such as RIP or OSPF and also allow into VLAN routing. The VLANs can communicate to one another. Most layer 3 switches do not have any exterior routing protocol such as BGP or the border gateway protocol which is the protocol that the internet uses unless you're paying massive amounts of money on the hardware. At this point we should discuss tags, trunks and access ports. Within an ethernet frame is the destination and source MAC address which is the MAC header followed by the ether type which determines the protocol that's encapsulated in the payload of the frame. When VLANs are involved, four octets or 32 bits are inserted into the frame between the source, MAC address and the ether type. This is called a tag. The first 16 bits are the tag protocol identifier, which identifies if the frame contains a tag, followed by the tag control information. The last 12 bits of this field contain the VID or the VLAN identifier to specify which VLAN the frame belongs to. This is all passed in a hexadecimal format 0x001 equates to 1, which is the default VLAN ID. Trunking is when we send tagged and untagged VLAN information down a single network link. Because all this information is being sent down a single link, the tag must be added to distinguish the frame once the data reaches the VLAN aware device. So our trunk links are carrying Ethernet frames with VLAN information for VID 1, 100, 200, and 254, but the tags 100, 200 and 254 are being disregarded by my switch and I'm being put into VLAN 1, Management LAN. 
So we need to set up the switch to understand the VLAN tags coming down the trunk link and configure a trunk port. The trunk port is a designated port on a switch which will receive all tagged and untagged VLAN traffic. And if necessary, send VLAN traffic out of another configured trunk port to another VLAN aware device. When the Ethernet frame reaches the switch port, the switch looks at the destination and source MAC address. It then cross-references which port the destination MAC address is associated by looking in its MAC address table. The VLAN trunk hasn't been configured in the switch and a tagged frame is received, the tag is disregarded. If the trunk is configured, the switch again looks at the MAC address table, finds the MAC address and then uses the tag to send data to the port that is part of that VLAN. But how does the switch know what VLAN the port belongs to? The answer is access ports. An access port is a switch port that is configured to be part of the VLAN group. You might have ports 1 to 20 as access ports for VLAN 100 and 21 to 31 for VLAN 200. Now scenario 1 is a core switch and two secondary switches so there will be a few trunk ports in the core switch. So I'll go to the core switch 172 16.25.10. I'll go to VLANs and I'll add three additional VLANs. So I'll do VLAN 100 for accounts. 200 for human resources and 254 for the server. In this grid, I have access ports and trunk ports. Because I'm using this switch as a core switch with no devices connected, I'll set port 24 and set port 23 and port 20 as trunks across all VLANs. This means that port 24 will receive the VLAN information, cross reference that information in its MAC table, but the host device will not be in the MAC address table. So we'll resend the frame out the trunk ports downstream to the secondary switches, which will then cross-reference the device MAC address in their respective MAC address table. So now I've configured the switch trunk ports, I go to my secondary switches and add the same VLAN IDs and configure their trunk ports and their access ports. I'll replicate the switch configurations across both these switches. So port eight will be my trunk, port five will be an access port to VLAN 100, port six will be an access port to VLAN 200. On switch C, I'll put port 1 as an access port on VLAN 254. This is the server. We want to route out to the internet, provide our host with a correct IP that's relevant to the VLAN, look into intercommunication between VLANs and isolated VLANs that can access a common resource such as a server. For the most part, we will need a layer 3 device such as a router. So on my router, I go to settings and LAN. From here, I need to configure some DHCP servers. So when I connect to the VLAN via a switch port or wireless, I'll be given an IP address within that VLAN DHCP range. By default, VLAN 1 is management. I'll add a second and a third. I'll add VLAN ID 100. Call it accounts. I'll set the DHCP mode to server and leave the range to default, which is 192.168.100.100.199 and I'll leave the DNS server as proxy for this setup. Create another VLAN, VLAN ID 200, and I'll name it Human Resources. And set the DHCP mode to server, and leave the default range for now, and leave the DNS again as proxy. and I'll configure a fourth. I'll give it a VLAN ID of 254 and name that server. So now we need to tie the VLANs to a physical interface on the router. So I go to advanced and VLANs, and then we can see the DHCP servers are configured in the LAN page have populated in the VLAN page. LAN port 3 is my downlink to the rest of the network, so I will set accounts, human resources and server to tagged on LAN port 3. At this point, I don't want to enable into VLAN routing, but I'll go over that later on what it does. Device management allows me to access the router's web interface from its respective VLAN. Then I've got physical LAN ports on the back of the router, which is essentially a small network switch. By default, the LAN ports are untagged. This is so you can connect any device to the ports and you'll get an IP address on the default VLAN and get a connection to the internet. A lot of host devices aren't VLAN aware, so you plug them in and they will work. If I were to set LAN port 2, VLAN 1 to excluded, and VLAN 200 to tagged, and plug my laptop in, I wouldn't be able to obtain an IP address because my laptop can't understand VLAN tagging, so I would get an APIPA address. If I connect my MacBook to switch A on the port that's associated with the accounts VLAN, 
you'll see I get an IP address in the 192.168.100 range. I then connect my Windows laptop to switch B on the accounts VLAN as well, and I also get an IP address in the 100 range. From the Windows laptop connected to switch B, I'll generate a ping to the MacBook on switch A, and I get a reply. Also from the Windows, if I generate a ping to the gateway, so 192.168.100.1, I also get a ping response. On my MacBook and Switch A, I can also ping the gateway 192.168.100.1. If I now connect my MacBook to the Human Resources VLAN on Switch A, I get an IP address of 192.168.200.100. If I generate a ping from the laptop on accounts, I get a destination host unreachable. I left the device management tab off in the router. So if I attempt to go to 192.168.200.1 to get to the UI, it won't go anywhere. So I'll go back to the management LAN on 172.16.25.1 and I'll go to the router and enable device management. If I go back to human resources VLAN and go to 192.168.200.1, I can now get to the router's web UI. Another topology I've come across when configuring VLANs is using daisy chains. Daisy chaining isn't the most reliable method. As a rule of thumb, daisy chains should have no more than three switches linked, but sometimes it just can't be helped. We have this situation, we just need to pass the trunk through each switch to the last switch. So we leave the router configuration as is and can even leave the core switch as is, but we just need to set two ports as the trunk, the uplink and the downlink ports. So I'll remove port 20 in this instance and leave port 24 and 23 as the trunk. 24 is coming from the router and 23 is going to the first switch in the daisy chain. On the switch A, we can set port 8 as a trunk and then we can set port 2 as a trunk, which is the uplink and downlink ports. And again, configure the access ports relevant to the VLAN ID. On the final switch B, we do the same, but I only have to configure one trunk port, which is the uplink from switch A. And finally set the access ports that are relevant. And that's it, simple as that but I personally prefer a central switch connected to the secondary, so I'm going to revert the config. So what if you want to have communication between VLANs and why would you want that? For instance, if you have a home automation system such as Control 4, Savant or ELAN, and you want to have devices such as CCTV cameras and skyboxes on their own broadcast domain, then inter-VLAN routing needs to be enabled if you want to be able to access the video streams on the control system or control them boxes via an IP control method. In this demonstration, we're going to be using a router on a stick. Just as we have it set up, a single interface on the router is configured as a trunk with multiple IP addresses that correspond to the VLAN ID configured on the switch. In the router web UI, if I go to system and clients and services, I have a device on here that's the IP address of 192.168.254.100, which is a music server. I now connect to the accounts VLAN. If I generate a ping, I get a request timeout. If I go back to the management VLAN and go to advanced and VLANs and enable inter VLAN routing, so VLAN 100, 200, and 254 can communicate with one another, but not with the management VLAN. We just want VLAN 100 and 200 to be able to communicate to a common resource on VLAN 254. So I'll save the config and my MacBook's IP address is now 192.168.100.101. If I go to the terminal and ping 192.168.254.100 from the accounts VLAN, I'm getting an ICMP response, meaning I can communicate to the server. I can also access it via the web browser. So if I go to my web browser and type in 192.168.254.100, 254.100, I get connected to the server, but it redirects me to the website, that's just part of the product. So if I'm allowing VLANs to communicate, then why don't I just put all the hosts on one VLAN or just leave it all on the management LAN? As well as keeping users away from the management network devices, it comes down to managing broadcasts. Keeping devices in their own LAN segments or broadcast domains will help reduce the potential broadcast storms on the network. If you have 20 IP cameras connected to a switch, the cameras are sending broadcast packets out and the MVR is listening for them packets. If there are lots of broadcast packets flying around the network switch, it can become overwhelmed and you may see some performance issues such as slow connections, switches failing and trouble reaching out to the internet. Routers by default don't forward broadcast packets. So when interland routing is enabled, the broadcasts stay in the broadcast domain and only the information required to pass across the VLAN is traversed. So when it comes to VLANs and wireless access points, I have a video demonstrating the configuration of setting SSIDs to associate to a particular VLAN. 
and how you can enter the VLAN route so wireless devices can communicate with one another. So it's worth watching that video. Let's configure the VLANs from the command line. I'll leave the router as is and configure the switches. I'll be using PuTTY to telnet to the switches. I've set the switches back to the default configuration as if they're out of the box. So on the 24 port switch, go to PuTTY and log in. Now type in configure VLAN 100 name accounts exit VLAN 200 name human resources exit VLAN 254 name server and exit now I need to associate the ports that are going to be trunk ports then VLANs so I'll do interface gigabit ethernet 24 switch port mode trunk and enter do switch port trunk allowed VLAN add one so that's telling me now that port 24 is going to be a trunk port for VLAN 1 so now I'll do switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 100 switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 200 and the same again switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 254 and exit so I also now need to tell port 23 that is also a trunk port so I'll do interface gigabit ethernet 23 switch port mode trunk enter I do switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 1 switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 100 switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 200 and switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 254 so now port 23 is a trunk for VLANs 1 100 200 and 254 do exit and finally I do interface gigabit ethernet 20 switch port mode trunk enter the switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 1 and just follow the same way through as done for the past VLAN. So switch port trunk allowed VLAN add 100, 200, 254 and exit. I'll go to the 24 port switch now and refresh the page. You'll see the VLANs have been configured in the switch. So on the eight port switches, I do configure VLAN 100, name it accounts, exit. VLAN 200, name human resources, exit. VLAN 254, name it server. Now I need to associate the trunk ports to that switch. So I'll do interface gigabit ethernet eight, switch port mode trunk, and do switch port trunk allowed VLAN add one, and then I'll add 100, 200, and 254 to port 8. Now I'm going to tell the switch that port 3 is an access port. So I'm going to do interface gigabit ethernet 3, switch port access VLAN 100, exit, interface gigabit ethernet 6, switch port access VLAN 200. So now port 3 has access to VLAN 100 and port 6 has access to VLAN 200. If I now go to the switch web UI, you can see that the 24 port switch, the VLANs have been configured, and on the eight port switch, they've also been configured with the access ports. But what if we want to have complete isolation of all these VLANs, but allow one or two devices to communicate to a common resource, such as a printer or a server, or even a camera? Well, I thought we did that with inter VLAN routing. Well, we did, but that's also opened up the whole subnet range where VLAN 100, 200, and 254 can intercommunicate with each other. I can have any IP address on VLAN 100 and connect to the server or a host on VLAN 200. My next video is going to be how we can overcome this and keep the VLANs isolated but be able to communicate with a specific resource.